Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, beginning at verse 39. See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal, but no one can deliver out of my hand. I lift my hand to heaven and solemnly swear as surely as I live forever. And our epistle lesson today is from Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am going to go on living in the body, this will, be, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. And today's gospel comes from the book of John chapter 11, starting at verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her. Suppose she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with them also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb, and it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He has been dead for, three, for four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. You can think of an important event that takes place and usually when something is of such magnitude that there has to be some type of event that comes before it. It just demands some type of uh, attention that gets everybody's eyes focused on this one big thing. And we think of things like a concert, like a choir concert at school where there's a, a dry run, a dress practice, to make sure that all the details are in order, everything's ready to go, all the things that could go wrong have been thought through. You think of an example like the Super Bowl, 
you know, what is the game usually like at 7 o'clock at night or something like that, and already by noon there are commentators on saying, well, this could happen today, and watch for this could possibly happen. And the speculation just goes on for hours before the actual event itself. Now, one almost sees a dress rehearsal in the event before Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday, and that is the raising of Lazarus. The raising of Lazarus back from death set into motion Jesus' actual crucifixion. It was the last thing where those who despised Jesus finally decided we need to get rid of him. There was such anger. And to think how strange it was that they were upset. Here, a man had been raised to life who had been dead for days. And they want to see the one who did such a wonderful deed put to death. Now why did the miracle of bringing Lazarus back to life make the other religious leaders of the day so furious? Now Jesus, of course, had performed miracles before. He had healed many, placing his hands upon them, and sight was restored, and those who could not walk were able to. Why did this incident finally bring Jesus to the end of his earthly ministry? Now we think back in these signs in the book of John. In the book of John, there are six signs that Jesus performed that showed and demonstrated his glory. And the first one was at Cana of Galilee when the wine ran out, and so Jesus turned the water into wine. So that was the first one, the beginning of his public ministry. And here we are now on the other side of his public ministry, drawing to its conclusion. And Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead close to where Jesus himself soon would be crucified. Now, Bethany was a small city outside of Jerusalem, so it was almost kind of like this little sideshow before the main event. Jesus' resurrection and Lazarus' resurrection, there are similarities, of course, and the main similarity is that both individuals were raised from the dead. But they are very distinct in one certain way. Lazarus's raising was only for a period of time. Sometime into the future down the road, Lazarus faced the grave again. And when Lazarus died that second time, there was no one to raise him at that moment. And Lazarus still remains in the ground. But not so with our Lord. For we remember that while he was also dead for days, that he has been risen from the grave, and he now reigns eternally. Now, there were similarities, and there were differences in these raisings, but they are certainly related to one another, not only in one occurring not too long after the other. What were the circumstances in particular that led to a pre-Easter before the actual day? Now, time was running out for Jesus, He knew that his earthly end was coming, and it was time to pull out all the stops and to demonstrate the full power of God before that greatest demonstration ever in his resurrection. And since Jesus was both divine and human, it was logical, we assume, that he was experiencing some misgivings about the whole thing. Like any other human being, Jesus was likely feeling upset about what was coming because he knew his end was close. As we remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he faced his arrest and his crucifixion, the sweat poured down his face as he prayed, Father, may this cup pass from me, if there be any other way. But he's prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And so we can only imagine the the troubles that Jesus was feeling as he saw his friend Lazarus dead in the ground, and knowing that his turn was coming in short order. Perhaps Jesus wanted to put those powers and the Father to the test. After all, it wouldn't have been such a big deal if Jesus had not been able to somehow call upon the Father and have Lazarus raise him from the dead. Sure, that would have been embarrassing, It would have been a big deal to the negative if Jesus had said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus didn't come forth. But that would have still been a lesser deal 
than Jesus was facing in his own upcoming mortality. And so we imagine that Jesus wanted to be guaranteed that when God the Father was called upon to raise someone from the dead, that his father would actually pull through. And so it was not only for Christ's self, but it was also for the disciples too. Because their death was coming as well. That we remember that it was only John was the one of the only disciples, the only one who lived to a long age. And so it was a it was a assurance for them too that God does actually honor his word. And when he says, I will raise my children up, it was an encouragement for them both. Jesus made the statement in preparation for going to see Lazarus. He said to his disciples before he left, he said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And so through this, that as Jesus, the light of the world, was being prepared to leave this earthly realm, that he was showing them that they would not be walking alone. While his physical presence would no longer be with them each and every day, sharing meals together, that he would still be with them and they would not be walking in darkness, but in light. So here we are, the final test. And like any good teacher, Jesus was setting up the environment for learning in the correct way. Jesus didn't travel immediately to Bethany when he got the news that Lazarus was sick. The scriptures tell us that he waited for two whole days before doing anything about it. And when Jesus finally decided now was the time to go, his disciples had a sense, or at least some of them anyway, that this was the beginning of the end. Thomas remarked, as Jesus said, told them they would go see Lazarus, Thomas said, let us go with him, that we may die with him. Let us follow him, that we may die with him. Now some of the disciples caught this, like Thomas did. He knew this was the end. But still the other disciples never really got it. And we've seen that all throughout the scriptures. That even you know, with Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, and he had spent 40 days with the people reappearing, and right before he ascended, one of the disciples asked him, Lord, now are you going to establish the kingdom on earth? See, we're always, the disciples, they were, even though they had Jesus right in front of them, talking with them, they could ask him questions at any time, but they couldn't see it. So what is it like for us that we can't see Jesus physically, but yet he calls us to live in faith and trust just like Mary and Martha had to trust that Jesus could do something for them, for their brother Lazarus, and so they called upon him to come and, and do something. There's an expectation there. Just like at that first miracle once again. You remember, okay, the first of the six signs when the wine ran out at Cana of Galilee that the mother of our Lord came to Jesus and reported the problem. And when she told him, she gave instructions to those at the banquet or the, the wedding feast, do what he says. She had confidence that he could actually do something about it. And here we have that same expectation again. When Jesus arrived on the scene, Mary and Martha were so occupied in their grief that they didn't think in their minds, could Jesus still do something? You know, of course, logically, why would we think that? We don't normally think that kind of thing when somebody's gone already. We don't expect some huge miracle. We, they said to Jesus, oh, if you could have been here, then you could have helped him. While Jesus was certainly powerful enough to have healed Jesus two days earlier, he didn't for a specific reason, and we read that in our text today, that he waited two days. And when Jesus finally arrived on the scene, he was emotional. And we can only imagine, again, why he was emotional. He knew his own death was soon coming. Lazarus was one of his good friends. And he was overcome by grief enough that Jews who had been there to mourn with his family had said, see how he loved him. And so we have, again, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. 
And so Jesus put the words to the test. And as important as it was for Jesus to be there with the people, and that was part of his presence there, that he was just sharing in their grief and their misery, and he was crying tears just like they had cried. And it was important for Jesus to be there for Mary and Martha as well and bearing the burden with them. And I'm sure that Jesus wanted to see Lazarus's body too. But there was something bigger than just a sense of solidarity when Jesus arrived on the scene. There was a pre-Easter. The resurrection was going to be foretold. And we could almost say that just as this was a pre-Easter, it was a early Good Friday too. Because death was coming and the religious leaders were going to do anything in their power to try to prevent one who could give life. Because if you were to keep reading in our scriptures, it's not only Jesus for whom they plotted to kill, but they also plotted to kill Lazarus. And isn't that interesting? That one who had been raised up supernaturally and yet a few human beings thought they were going to put him down in the grave again. What hubris, what arrogance. And so they viewed Jesus as a threat, and they plotted to kill both of them. But it was not to be so because our Lord is the Lord of life and death. And he was powerful enough to raise Jesus after all these days, after his body had been decaying. And as they warned those who had gathered around his tomb, but Lord, he stinks. He was really, really dead. Not just passed out and revived with uh, CPR. He was really gone. His body was deteriorating. And yet all he said was, Lazarus, come forth. And there he was. And we can imagine on the scene what it would have been like for Lazarus. You know, he was wrapped in those bands. How could he hardly stood up? Have you ever thought about that? That, you know, you'd be like a mummy, you know, trying to move around. How did he do that? So Jesus gave the orders quickly, unwrap him. And let him go. What a powerful demonstration of Christ's power and very appropriate for the disciples and encouraging them, for encouraging himself, and for also showing that the resurrection is not only a temporary raising to life on this earth again, but that it will be a resurrection even more glorious than that of Lazarus. And so we call this event a pre-Easter. And we could really call all of our Sundays Easter Sunday. And there's even a choral anthem that's been written about that. Every morning is Easter morning from now on. And it's part of why we meet as Christians on Sunday. Even though, you know, the Jewish tradition in the Old Testament was to meet on the Sabbath, on Saturday. But we meet on Sunday, most Christians do anyway, because it is a perpetual celebration of the resurrection. And it's because we gather in this hope, we confess this creed that he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns forevermore. So we celebrate today, just like we celebrate on that spring morning when the flowers are up front and the trumpet sounds and, we, and people come that normally aren't here and relatives arrive that haven't been part of our community for a while who live in other towns. Yes, we have one day in particular to celebrate Christ's resurrection. But we have every day to celebrate Christ's resurrection. And aren't we glad that we do? Because there are many days in between those Sundays where we really need a little more assurance in our hearts. There are days, uh, just as we sang in that song this morning, you know, does Jesus care in my heart is, uh, you know, is, is too heavy for for words, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing here, but you get the idea that we need that encouragement not just one day a year, not just one day a week, but we need that assurance in our hearts that we live each and every day in the assurance of the resurrection. Because as the days go on, as you get older, as you see more and more familiar names in the obituaries, as you read them each morning in the paper, that how important it is That we have a God who not only is powerful enough to fix our situation for the moment, and he certainly does those things too, and we pray for his deliverance from whatever troubles we may be experiencing in our lives at the moment, but that he is powerful enough to be more 
uh, to have more strength and more authority than anything in this world. How does that not make us rejoice each and every day to know that Christ Jesus is risen from the dead, not only for now, but for eternity. So let's pray about that today. Heavenly Father, as we think on this account of your friend Lazarus and how it must have pained you on some level to have your son hold back and not be with him, not only to share in his suffering, but to know that he could do something right away and avoid all the pain and the heartache of seeing their beloved friend slowly pass from this world. But Lord, you had a purpose. And so your son waited two days to arrive on the scene and how Mary and Martha lamented his uh, presence there and how they said to him, Oh Lord, if you had just been here, her brother would have been alive. But we know, Lord God, that there was something even greater than some temporary fix, that you were assuring your son, that you were assuring his disciples that he really is powerful enough to raise one from the grave. And not only that, but that you raise us to life everlasting. That resurrection morning is opening the gate to eternal life. And that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too will also walk in that newness of life into eternity. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be encouraged, each one of us, as we each have people in our lives who are no longer physically part of our lives. With us in memory, and Lord, we await our reunion. Give us strength, Lord, to have faith, and those words of hope that you give to us through the promise of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord God, for all those who do not know that hope, like the religious leaders who even wanted to arrest Jesus and take away Lazarus. Lord, for the greatest hope in the world, they had only hatred and fear. And we pray, Lord God, that we would show the world through our words and our actions that, well, your law is to be feared, and while your judgment is to be taken seriously, that your love is also something to sustain us each and every day. So, Lord, we pray that you would move each one of our hearts, that we would be bold in our witness, that we would be determined in our actions. Help us, Lord, to repent of our sins so that we could know something much greater and much more glorious, the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.